Phil Goddard. Welcome to the Coach's Journey podcast. Oh, Robbie, thank you so much for inviting me on here. I love being this side of the, well, this side of the microphone, this side of the whole podcast thing. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny, like I, we were just talking before we switched on and, and when I reached out to, to, to invite you onto the show, I mentioned that um, like I created this podcast basically thinking there was nothing like it out there. I, I thought I'd searched all the podcast platforms for something like it. I obviously hadn't because I, I can't remember how long it was, but after three, four, five months, I came, then came across your show. Um, uh, the coaching life, which is um, everyone should check out. There's loads of great, um, loads of great interviews on there, um, including some uh, guests that will be familiar to listeners of this show. Um, and like I said, I did have a sinking feeling when I first uh, first <laughs> saw that. But um, you know, and also I, um, like I was saying to you in the message, was really glad actually that I'd found it afterwards because I think that even if I'd found it before, the right thing for me to do would still have been to make this podcast. Um, but uh, my resistance or uh, all, the, all, that, all those strange things that we do to ourselves might have slowed it down even further if I'd seen that show first. But generally, I just think it's really like, in some ways, obviously, there weren't enough podcasts about coaching at the time, because I didn't know about that one. And I'd been coaching for four years or something. Um, yeah. So it's great that there are, are now more out there. Um, one thing I want to check, check in with you, though, Phil, I don't know how you feel about this. So you know, first of all, at least in the UK, it felt like there was pretty much just you, right? And then maybe there was a time when there was me and you making the show. And then we had two um, <laughs> British men with very little hair who like wearing blue shirts um, uh, and like football. Uh, and now, especially since COVID, like I feel a bit put off because there are like a million new coaching podcasts out and it is no longer a corner of the world uh, held by people like us. They're coming and they're taking our corner, Phil. What should we do about it? What should we do? Um, I think there's more than enough listeners to go around. <laughs> I really do. Uh, it probably sounds like a really cliche answer, but I kind of don't have that much thinking about it. And I know, you know, you could you could uh, use what you've said in the context of, you know, coaches um, rather than just post podcast hosts, of course. But I don't. I, I certainly used to. I feel like when I sit in a chair like this and kind of reflect on, you know, coaching journey, feels like I've been in the game a long time. But, uh, you know, there are some real veterans that I've come across as well. They're often hard to uh, to to eke out, to come across, to find them. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, I find... I'm, I'm more than happy. The more the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. One of the beauties of this profession, and podcasting as well as coaching is the diversity so uh yeah i mean welcome i'm really i welcome you into this podcast <laughs> world like um i i love it in the same way as i feel anybody who's entering in the coaching world anybody who's enjoying if you're enjoying doing podcasting then yeah, who cares what anybody else thinks <laughs> yeah you're absolutely right and you're you, it's a good it's good to draw it draw it to coaching as well you know i think one of the things i was thinking about just as i was making lunch today before we had this call was, you know, it's almost two years since I started this podcast. I thought I was a bit late to the podcast show then, right? And then now I feel like a podcasting veteran compared to loads of new podcasts that have come out. It definitely right. feels like it's still yeah. growing. And that is so true about, about coaching as well, um, that it feels to me like it's still growing. Um, yeah, you've been in it longer than me, but I, I remember when I was like two years into coaching, and that was about the point when sometimes it started more happening more that when someone said, how long have you been coaching, Robbie? And I said, about two years. They would say, oh, you've been doing this a while then. And I'd be like, no, I haven't. But suddenly, because of the influx into the industry, you can quite quickly become the kind of experienced voice in the room. Yeah, you can. You can. I still consider myself a bit of a, a certainly a beginner as far as learning goes, really. Um, but I guess there's less of an obsession with the learning, like the learning's happening as opposed to trying to make it happen. So there's much less of an obsession with that. And actually the same goes for podcasting as we kind of, you know, mentioned that brief conversation before you hit the record button. I know that I, this also applies to my coaching as well, that at the outset, I was trying to be air quotes here, the podcast host, you know, and um, I go back and listen to those. And of course, they're cringeworthy, but um, and the same as I'm sure that would be if I went back to some of my earlier coaching conversations, because essentially I was trying to be somebody. And yet I've found podcasting and coaching and indeed life much easier 
once I've, once I stopped trying to be anybody, including stop trying to be myself, because there's like an idea we can have about that. Really, it's just I just drop all of that and uh, just show up, and I'm interested in the person that's sitting opposite me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so many things we could uh, jump off from what you've just said on, but but instead, actually, uh, let's rewind a little bit. And I guess I want to start off as we often do, or, or bridge as I often do in these podcasts. To when did you first come across this thing? coaching <laughs> i chuckle because i came across it um about 15 years after i realized i was doing it <laughs> uh, or about 15 years after i started doing it in fact i didn't realize i was doing it until even after that and uh, it was uh, uh somebody who was coaching me last year pointed out to me that uh some of the stuff i was doing in in my leadership roles i did a long time in corporate 26 years or something what, what um, kind of things were you doing or, or companies were you working so with? i uh, uh so you're british i worked for bt worked in various telecoms companies companies that were working for telecoms companies and stuff um always been a bit of a tech geek and i really like having technology as a as a hobby now rather than as a as a job um so yeah, technical positions, but um, since about 1991, um, it was when I, it was 1990, 91, that I um, had like my first leadership position just in small teams. Those coaches talking to me last uh, last year to see if they can eke out, you know, what we do, well, what's gone on in the past, what, what can you make more use of? And I uh, realized that I was having conversations that by definition, you would say were coaching conversations with people um, back then. Weekly, one-on-one -on -one conversations with my direct reports about absolutely anything they wanted to talk about in or out of work. Um, and anything that they wanted to, really anything they want to talk about, anything they wanted to create. So yeah, I realized I've been having coaching conversations for, oh my goodness, 30 years. I actually came across coaching around about when I did some NLP training in 2003, 2004, and came across it as a, as a profession around about that time, 2000 or 2005, and actually quit my job and thought, oh, this is the bit about my job that I enjoy the most. I'm out of here. I want to do this full time. I don't want to be sitting on conference calls um, with India all day, every day, talking about technical bit and then just having, you know, a few hours a week of the really great bit that I enjoy, the one on one conversations. I want to be doing that. Um, and as an aside, maybe we'll talk about it, but failed miserably initially, went back to corporate, went back to my full time job for a while and then finally left in 2011. But yeah, coaching as a concept and indeed as a profession that came about uh that's coming up for 20 years and 18 years ago or whatever um and i remember even then like immersing myself in all of the books reading consuming 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 um <laughs> you know the co-active coach all kinds of stuff god so many so many books yeah um again lots of places we could go but i, I got curious about yeah, you just found yourself basically doing this thing, you know, mm -hmm. I think you said in like kind of early 90s. So we we're on for 30 years ago, you just buy, you know, in a way and but not all managers are like this, especially not all managers, if you're in the kind of tech part of a business. Right. And um, so why do you think you were doing that? Yeah, um, I don't, the honest answer is I don't know. I would just be making something up. But I've <laughs> always been fascinated with people. And in fact, I would say right back when I've, you know, gone back and considered a similar question. I do like one of my earlier school memories. In fact, my mother is reminding me my very first day at what we call infant school here, right in the UK. Apparently my first day, the teacher, uh, my mum come and picked me up at the end of the day and asked my teacher, how was it? And, and the teacher apparently just said, oh, he's, he was fine. He seemed happy enough, but he didn't mix with anyone. He just like stood on the, on the edge of the playing field. And I always remember that I'd just been like the proverbial people watcher, observer, and just really fascinated with people. I, I don't want to join in. <laughs> which is kind of funny because I de definitely do. But certainly at the time, I think I've just always been fascinated with people, with, with, with other people and what makes them tick and stuff. And, and, I, and so I was really, I can remember being ecstatic when I got invited to lead a particular team for the first time back in 1990, whenever it was. And um, 
because I thought, great, because part of my actual job would now be caring for those people rather than just at the time we were doing uh, computer support. So rather than just making sure that um, people, people's computers worked okay, their old desktop IBMs worked okay, I got to, as a job, to start caring for people. I don't know what it, what it was in that, but, um, and, and <laughs> to come forward, you know, almost 30 years later, it was, it was actually a, a Robert Holden event where we had to come up with a, like a, a new job title for what it is we do, this, what we is we do in life. And the only thing I could come up with was lover. And, and I get it, that sounds really cliche, but I actually think as coaches, um, one of the things, most powerful and profound things we can do is to love the person in front of us, like in, in its purest sense. And, and I mean that like when we love somebody, we are seeing them beyond all of the BS stories that they might have about themselves. So at this, I don't know where it came from. Did I arrive here with it? Or was it some you know, childhood trauma, mummy or daddy issues? I've got no idea, to be honest with you, Robbie. But I do remember that I've always, always loved that whole people aspect of any, any work that I've done. Mm -hmm. Let's come back to Robert. Let's come back to love, definitely. Um, but then maybe let's go to... You know, if you failed, if that first, what did you say, failed miserably in that 2005 launch yeah. of the coaching business, <laughs> why did you fail? What did you do? How, what, you know, oh, well, like, goodness. and also what was it like, I guess also I'm just curious, just caught it just there. And like that energy you must have had to, to see this mm -hmm. thing through the NLP training and, and then just to like quit. Like that is some serious, something was, you were getting some kind of signal there from something. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, when you know somebody's really wise or somebody's really crazy, it just depends yeah. on like the consequences, right, of their <laughs> actions in a way. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Actually. I just want to reflect on that because I, I don't, I don't really know what was going on. There certainly was a lot of energy there, um, and. You know, when you come across something quite new, I've had this at various stages with various things in my life and I've definitely calmed down a lot of even just the last four or five years, actually. But we can we can come across something and be quite um, evangelical about it. And, uh, you know, like ahead of that, if we go back a couple of years, I read a line in a book. I was on holiday, on holiday in Egypt in Sharm el-Sheikh and uh, read this line out of uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Um, the one line isn't really irrelevant and it's often attributed to, to somebody else, but it's not. It was his, but it was in that that I realized, I had this moment where I realized, oh, I'm creating my entire experience of life. And I dropped is, the book. Is the line, um, and when I read, see the world not as it is, but as we are? Is it that one? No, it was actually between stimulus and response, there's a gap. And in that gap lies your ultimate freedom. See, so oh. an insight to personal, right? And it's just like, oh, I get it. I'm creating it all in that gap. The gap is me. And um, I want to come bring that back around to your question. But anyway, I was like really evangelical about that book. Like I was, I actually, when I got back, I bought four copies. And I think this is kind of pre-Amazon days. So I was getting them like from Waterstones or whatever. And gave them to friends and family and other people didn't really get it. So like, you know, I've had stages in my life where I've been filled with that energy and just really driven, right? This is what I'm going to do. And of course it hasn't always worked out. Uh, that can be just giving 10 copies of books to a friend, or it can be quitting my job and deciding I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can create a coaching business. But what I did, and maybe this is what perhaps your listeners would be most interested in is, or rather what I didn't do is I had no focus at all on building a coaching business. My entire focus was actually on um, just kind of like, okay, I, I want to create clients. And even that, uh, my view on that has changed. I'm sure we'll come to that as things progress. But I really, I, I, I quit my job. I saved up a little bit of cash, but that was why I went back a year later. I'd run out of cash. Um, and so, like I said, I went back for another five years and saved up even more, saved up like a, a six figure amount of money thinking, okay, this time I'm really going to go for it. But it's still, I still faffed around by the way, for a couple of years before I started investing in help. But um, yeah, I, I, it was really an idea. It was, I was winging it. There was no structure to what I was doing. Um, 
I remember running like a leadership workshop that time, but it really, I just didn't know what the hell I was doing, Robbie. I had the, I had the desire to coach people and I was, I was getting people come to me just, you know, through referrals of, of the people that I had already coached, but there was like all one-off sessions and these are small fees. Like somebody initially gave me 20 pounds. I, I want to pay you for this conversation. Those kind of fees, really small stuff. And then, so there was, I hadn't given any consideration at all to creating a coaching business. And then you went back to work because you ran out of money. And then, mm. is it, and then did I get this right? You then you saved up some more money. So did you know you were going to give it another go? Even I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to do that. And I can, and in, indeed I did continue to coach, you know, outside of work. So it was like, you would call part-time or whatever as a, as a side gig. Um, so yeah, I can technically say I've been coaching <laughs> professionally. I've been getting paid for coaching since 2005. And, um, but again, like they say, yes, I did I, over those five years, saved up a bunch of money, but it didn't really change actually until I know you mentioned this on, um, you mentioned this on your podcast often, I think, uh, the, the book, the prosperous coach that, that did change everything for me. In fact, not yeah. just, not just the coaching business, but actually really how I was approaching certain aspects, aspects of my life. But yeah, that, that was a, that was a game changer. Just really, uh, focusing on being of service rather than just getting clients. So is that the, I think you kind of said that, you know, you went back and had two years of kind of, you know, trying it. And then that takes us to about when the book came out, I think. So was it, was that uh, what made the So I did, yeah, let's just, let's just, let's just dot the I's, cross the T's. So I quit in 2005. I went back to 2006, five years, worked in corporate and doing some coaching as a side gig. I left on 15th of April, 2011. Faffed around. I'm not going to forget that date. Faffed yeah. around for until 2013. Did you, did, did you mark the 10 year? Uh, I did a little bit this year, but not, not spectacularly. But I, <laughs> I wrote a little bit. I wrote a little bit about it. It's just another, yet yeah, another opportunity to reflect and think, holy shit, how things have changed like in 10 years. Um, yeah, like I say, it wasn't until <laughs> there's a, a really weird story. You know, if we, if we run out of things to talk about, I'll tell you the story of how I got a copy of the book, The Prosperous Coach. But anyway, it's really quite funny. <laughs> so, and, I think you have and, to stay, tell that story now. I think it's like, you, okay, you, so I, I started dating someone who had been given a copy of that book by somebody, you know, so she was considering dating either of us. I don't think I've ever told this in public and I'm not even sure I should really, but anyway, what the hell, here we go. So it was just at a stage where I think she was talking to both of us. He'd given her a copy of this book and um, it got to a stage between me and her that she made a choice. She wanted to continue with me. So she told him, okay, thanks, but no thanks. And then she gave me a copy of the book and it changed my life. And I, I kind of <laughs> like, I find that, I find that quite funny and uh, I'm very grateful, uh, very grateful for that guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, again, that's just, uh, it's just kind of, that, that was a game changer, that, that book. And I immersed myself then from, what was it? September, 2013. I, you know, flew to the States and went to my first, um, coaching immersion a prosperous coach immersion and did shed loads and i really immersed myself and i went to several rich litvin's uh prosperous coaching immersions ended up on his leadership team and uh and did you know steve chandler's uh training as well his school so but that was really the first time i'd, I'd been coached previous to that but probably also coached by i'm i'm I don't mean it's derogatory, but I just mean probably by inexperienced amateurs. Let's just, just be very straight up about it. Um, he hadn't got the wealth of experience, particularly that, that, that Steve Chandler um, is able to draw upon. So um, it wasn't until then that I started to get any kind of system together. Um, I mean, I did have a system. It just wasn't a very good one. As Steve says, you know, every, every system is perfect, the results it gets. So uh, and my system was indeed just winging it rather than, uh, you know, connecting with people and what have you. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of, you know, you were in there pretty, I guess the, they were both already working with coaches in different ways at that point, I think. But you're in there pretty early after the book came off, came out. What was it like to work with those two men who've had such an impact on the industry, right? There's a reason that, you know, you're not, like you say, you're not the only um, guest I've had on the show. It's part of my story, right? Is, is that that book somehow captures something which for many of us makes this 
thing that we now do and love to do <laughs> possible and what what was the impact that it had on you and what was it like doing work and spending time with both of them yeah uh th i think that the biggest shift was the shift from getting to giving in a nutshell right? instead of getting clients getting work um getting money getting fees um it just that's probably the biggest shift around into right okay where can i give who can i help and connecting with them it's funny yes you say early days because i think that first prosperous coach intensive that i went to was actually the book launch um mm -hmm. i think um i think they'd done an intensive in the may but i don't think the book was actually readily available then and this was it was certainly it was classed as a book launch you know the book signing and stuff um it was gosh it's hard to put into word actually because it was revolutionary in in how it changed what i was seeing and how these guys were treating me you know as a as a as a surely as a prospect for them but what they were giving how they were being of service um to me before i'd even paid them a, a single dime so to speak and um i'd not come across that i'd not come across that before in probably in any walk of life really um and also in particular with Rich, I remember it was, I think I, I read the book and then joined the group on Facebook, I think, and um, just reached out to them or, or maybe commented on a post or something that, you know, the effect the book had had on me. And then of course, Rich then started messaging me and he offered me, you know, some videos to watch, but he really wanted me to give him you know, what are the three top insights that I have from him and stuff. And you can, I could just see, you know, now uh, the book playing out really, what you've written in the book, how that, how it's playing out. But here's an important thing though, Robbie, is that I realized, so I've kind of gone full circle as well, probably more than once actually on that book, as I have done with many, is it a T.S. Eliot quote is that we shall never cease from exploring, but the end of all of our exploration shall be to return to the place we left and know it for the first time. And I, I've, I've done this, and certainly a lot of people that I've um, had conversations with have done this by we can read something, but the message really is very often not in what it's said. It's really in the energy of what is said, which very often as an author myself, I can go back to some of my stuff that I've written years earlier and notice, ah, oh, so that was what was coming through for me. And I think um, probably Rich and Steve might say the same thing in the, the books not to be taken literally, absolutely not. For sure, there's some principles there, but it's not a book about technique. However, since I had a very poor technique, very poor strategy. So to take the book as a technique and strategy, that certainly helped, but that's not really the core of what's on offer there. There's a kind of a way of being that's on offer. If you really get that in the book and, 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 and you can be that way without doing anything practical that's actually suggested in the book. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely does. And is, is the, is that way, or the first time you read it, maybe was that way um, giving versus getting uh is that that distinction you made before or, or was the energy something slightly different like for you what's there's the, still what's i mean there's there? yeah there's still i think there's still very important principles there um that shift really from being of service being of help and um to give the focus being on the client yeah. rather than perhaps on on the coach right <laughs> um leading Certainly, like really owning and leading. I remember one time in, uh, I've told this, I think on my own podcast, uh, I was in Steve Chandler's school. So I did his school in 2014. And uh, I only did it once, even though some of my friends have done it like multiple times. And it was, it was um, Carolyn Freya Jones, who was coaching me in the room. You know, I'd asked a question and, and Steve has just said, Carolyn, do you want to answer this one? And I had a, I had a prospect who was, Give me a little bit of the runaround and 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 i just wasn't leading and i remember carolyn saying to me come on phil when are you going to step for when are you going to become the professional coach? come on come on she was like when are you going to be the professional coach and i noticed something in me in that moment it's like just like a shift an energetic shift if you like it's like i oh, yeah, okay i really get it yeah of, of being the professional coach of really just being that so there's that inner shift which of course 
we all want to be able to describe in words and techniques and mantras and meditations. And that's why there's tens of thousands of books on this kind of thing. Perhaps it's not necessarily describable or there's certainly not one way of describing it, but there was definitely a shift in me in a way of being probably even in that exact moment where I just, oh, I get it. Mm. I get it. And from then started showing up differently, behaving differently, being differently. And I remember this particular prospect who was still messaging me and whatever. And I actually said, okay, if you want to proceed, this is what I need from you. Blah, 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 blah. And that, and that was that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very powerful book and there's a lot in there on offer beyond even those 18 principles that are described. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a, you know, this setting that, you know, I think Rich at least is uh, still teaching. Steve probably is as well. You know, that, that phrase that you just used there, here's what I think it was, here's what I need from you. Like as soon as, you, if you can say that to a client, then there's something shifting. If you can say it, I mean, you don't have to say it and mean it, especially if you're doing it in writing, <laughs> but if you say it and mean it even more so, but there is something really important, you know, I think in that, in that concept of leadership as a coach in the enrollment process, but, but throughout the engagement as well. And that in the right ways, of course. The thing is, you can't. I, I, I know I've done this. I know I've done this. In that, you can't really fake that. <laughs> I mean, you can. It can appear like it, but then you are like just the actor, yeah. right? So I can be the actor who's reading the like. Okay, so I remember Jamie Smart telling me I need to top and tail the cool. Yeah. I need to tell them I'm going to do this, and I'm going to just get their permission to bring up the whole subject of uh, money at the end. So I'm going to I'm going to be doing that. But in my mind, I'm I'm the actor. Uh, and I'm, I'm like, you know, relaying a script and there's a real difference to being the actor, to actually really being that person who is leading. And when you say, this is what I need from you, that is for you, what you need from that person to move <laughs> forward. It's like, what do I need from you? If you want to work with me, I'll tell you what I need from you is I need you to have a sense of humor. Like that's the first thing that comes to mind. And I can say that because that is really true for me. So when I say, here's what I need from you, I want to be speaking from the same grounded certainty that that is my heart speaking rather than some script. Yeah, I want to catch two things in there. Let me just check them with you though, because I think it's like, uh, you know, I'm this, you know, these aren't necessarily things I've thought about in great detail in this way, but it feels like it's what it's emerging. So one part is there's a, for me, there's a piece where there's like, where it's not acting, it's practicing. So maybe that's the distinction. It's like, there are times when I've totally acted (laughs) and I'm like, exactly like you say, I've heard Jamie Smart say this thing, therefore I am gonna say that in this call in as most convincing a way as I I can. Um, But there's also like, here's how I'm gonna talk about my work from now on. It's gonna be a bit goofy the first time I do it, uh, even though I've practiced it five times by myself just before this um, meeting with somebody. Uh, And it was gonna take me, I don't know, 10 before I'm like, before it feels in me and I deliver it. And that might just be me, but I think that that, I've seen that practice play out in other parts of of my life. Um, And then I think the other thing that you said that that is just so important, it's like, yeah, like if, if you're gonna say, this is what I look for in my clients, or here's what I need of you, or this is how I work, like make it true, you know, it has to be true. <laughs> and it, it doesn't have to be that you've done, like, I think sometimes people get a bit lost in like, I have to have done 15 island retreats on Zakynthos, let's talk about that in a bit, before I can say, I, well, one of the ways I work with my clients is I do these island retreats, right? That's not necessarily yeah. true. You just have to have chosen that that's one of the ways you work with your clients and that it is gonna be one of the ways you work with your clients and you have to have really chosen that. and then. You can say it with integrity without it being totally um, the actor. So, so is it, I think there's a, uh, we can even simplify this down even more in that. So even before I'd run my first retreat, and I've only done seven, not 15, but anyway, it's, but <laughs> I know it's just a in the air example, but so I can, I can speak with some experience of that. Um, but even before I'd done that and indeed with anything like, so I didn't do any re- treats in Bali when I was living there but um 
and, I, and let me just think somewhere even somewhere where i haven't been where, wherever do you know i've never actually been to tuscany i right? talked about doing that with some friends but if i wanted to run a retreat there there is this difference between um, talking about how i think it should be spoken about um what i really want to be doing is speaking about which sounds so cliche doesn't it but i want to speak about what it is that i'm enthused about like it's my energy it's in my heart as in you know i, I had the idea to take some clients to zakynthos one year i sat on this really rickety blue bench overlooks this beautiful harbor and the thought occurred to me oh, i'd be lovely i would love to be sitting here with a client and having those kind of conversations and that was the energy of enrolling people to come and do that like i would love i would love to sit there with you on that bench i would love to go and walk with you and have these kind of conversations but where we've got um space time and space so instead of us you know we're up against the clock and you've got a meeting after this and i'm just looking at colored pixels on a screen let's be sat next to each other let's even have a cold beer at lunch if we feel to but where you know we're not up against the clock and we can watch the sunset or whatever and then you know i'll meet you in a couple of days time it's like i'm 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 speaking even from an imagined experience but it's 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 really in me that like that's what i want and so it's, it's, it's the same thing, right? It's, it is authentic. It's not, oh, I think this is how it should be. You know, the opposite, I've heard people come out of the, the Rich Litvin stuff and like, oh yes, I coach Kings, really. I know for Rich that feels true, but you know, that's, that, but that doesn't need to, need to be your script. Here, here's the thing that when you speak from your heart, you don't need a script. You don't need a script. And the words actually, excuse me they matter much less than we might fear they do because <coughs> excuse me the words matter much less than we might fear they do because people kind of hear your energy that's how it looks to me yeah yeah i think people listening will have heard your energy just now and felt the truth of that and the thing one of the things that i felt in the middle of when you were you were doing that and you were kind of saying it you know what you might have said to a client about that first that first retreat was it also matters that that the i'd love to sit on that bench with you like you specifically oh, you sure. who i'm sitting with like and that has to be true i think that's one of the things and I fall, i've fallen into this trap with prospective clients before you know it's almost as soon as i've said i'd love to do this work with you when it's not true um the work is probably not going to happen has been my experience you know it doesn't matter how good i, I am know. at faking you're the person who do this work and i'm faking that because i haven't had a client for a while a new client for a while or the money's a bit tight or whatever um you know it, it it tends not to work pretty really, it doesn't I think it, I think it tends not to work only always probably um i have to think about that and look back through my clients and check if that's true but uh that's i've it. done it even even relatively recently um a little over a year ago there was somebody and i knew i just i had that feeling but i wasn't honoring it because yeah. i i really wanted i wanted something for him more than i think he wanted it and um yeah, it just, it didn't work out. It didn't work out very well. I don't think it ever does. Now, I'll tell you, I, I remember listening to people like Rich and Steve Chandler and whatever, who would say, really, they, they choose who they want to work with. But when you're, when you're a coach starting out and you've got bills to pay and you also need money, so that I, I know there was a bit of me that, well, well, I want to be able to work with almost anyone, right? Unless it looks like it's going to be a complete disaster um then I, then I feel i want to work with anyone but as you say it never really works out well and that actually i think because of because it can never work out very well it's e even if you do like need the money it's even more important to honor what's in your heart rather than in the head like is that that connection with that person how it feels you, we know, we always know if, if it is, if I tell you why, I, I don't always know that it's not going to be, but I definitely know when it is. I, I can turn into like the excited little boy. I don't hold anything back. I don't pretend to be anyone. Or if I'm speaking to somebody and I'm excited, they will know. They, it's like, it's unavoidable. 
that I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know how you're feeling, but this is, I, I <laughs> come on, let's do it. Like, I, I can't necessarily put it into words, but it's just like, that's not, that's not a, there's not a, like a proposal script, you know, that says, okay, we're going to work on these five points over this time together. Unless that feels right. Unless that's what's excited me. It's like, you know, well, there's, I know you've said that you're unclear whether you want to quit your job or not and certainly that yeah there's something in there i want to explore that more but there's also these other two things you've mentioned to me about your relationship with your son right and and i'm best friends with my son and yet i was disowned by my dad i want to explore that with you i want to spend some time to explore that with you and i can there's energy in me then like so i'm alive as the coach i'm alive i'm not a salesman i'm not i'm not coming from a script so what to say is is becomes an irrelevant question. The energy, the energy is what I think is is engaging. It's what's endearing. That's what's going to have somebody want to work with us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, I think people just listening will hear that energy. You can see it on my face. It's like it's worth actually. It's worth slowing down on that because because it is infectious. Um, when people have that energy, when someone you're with someone who's very alive in the moment, who's talking about some of the things they care about. And many people, you know, many of us, including me, you know, all of us, sometimes it's like we don't always have that feeling in ourselves. And so to be around someone else who has that feeling, sometimes that I feel like is, is one of the great gifts we can give. Um, hmm. There's two things that you've said that I want to that, that, that got to things that I wanted to catch. Let's start with Zakynthos. It's lovely to hear some of that um, that story about how it came to be. Um, one of the members of the I, we run a little community alongside this podcast, or I run a little community, and one of the members of it pulled out this quote from your website, which I think is um, probably the bench you were talking about, right? It says, on day one, we'll meet in the morning at a bench that overlooks the Bay, the bay of Silivi. I don't know how you say that, because- uh, Yeah, Silivi, yeah. Um, I guess it's lovely to have heard that origin for people who, like, how did you create that then? You know, I've read a little bit about on your website, but how did you, how did you choose or allow what happened on those on those retreats to happen like what 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 happens there what does it look like what's special about a retreat like that compared to your other work mm -hmm. yeah great question by the way and um i'm kind of wondering well will i disappoint you because i think there's much less to it for me but i, I also want to caveat this like I'm only ever going to talk about my experience and what's worked for me and indeed what hasn't worked for me. And one of the beauties of this profession is the diversity. And there are certainly coaches out there who will bring much more structure and um, yeah, even like a curriculum, if you like. There are some things that I do that do have more structure, but in just generally in a one-on-one -on -one, um coaching relationship with me the, the you know you, you bring whatever it is you've got going on and we might have a direction that we're going to be sailing towards so as i said you know this, it just came out as an idea i would love to that i'd already be, i was already doing one-on-one -on -one coaching by then and i just thought it would just be wonderful i would just love to have a be sitting here with a client having those kind of conversations so when i got back i just simply started talking about it to existing clients to prospects and then I would write about it. And I say, I've met seven clients out there in total. Um, the first one, by the way, I didn't get anybody in role, um, but I still went because I was going for a holiday anyway. And the night I arrived, I met a young lady in a bar there and it came up in a conversation and she said, huh, I'd like that. I'd like to do that. So we came up with uh, an agreement and it was just a few hundred pounds actually it was quite small compared to what I was originally going to charge and I'm like well I'm here let's just do it anyway so we did we did the the intensive well I guess I would call it an immersion rather than intensive it's kind of the opposite to intensive I think my <laughs> language of it has changed and there is now I call it an immersion because we just allow ourselves to be immersed in the presence of being there and it's a retreat because we retreat from our existing world of what we have what we have going on um there's very little structure we 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 meet in the morning um if it's the first day 
talk about just as I might that if it's at the beginning of uh, any coaching engagement you know what what is it that you envision would be a great outcome what would you like to talk about what do you want to explore during our time together how will you know if this has been um useful for you if it's been amazing for you those kind of really cliche coaching stuff and then I'm just with that person and I'm just with that person and and, and here's the thing that I uh, what I really love about it is it's actually not intense Mm-hmm. it's very relaxed it's very very relaxed and i think um one of my clients i might well have used uh, part of his testimonial actually to say that it's a different experience having that space you know uh, we would just spend time walking around the island and sometimes just in silence um and i think it's it's, it's actually it's very um easy for us to <laughs> I don't mean they're undervalued, but anyway, perhaps not necessarily appreciate the power of just being present with somebody without words. Um, so there is very little structure, if any. There's just a little. Um, the day's kind of open. We talk about whatever it is. I'm checking in. Jamie Smart would call it always calibrating, right? Um, as as we're going along, um, we have the day in between. And I'm available, and then we have that that but third day, day or second you, day together. You basically, don't see them though, right? There's, the, the there's a day, day. Yeah, we don't, don't see them. Yeah, yeah. And I've always done that. Uh, apart from one person came, and they only did one day. Okay, all right, fair enough. Um, yeah, so it's 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 kind of like an expanding out, like this ninety minute intense coaching one on one session over Zoom into what would it be 10 till four is only like six hours so into like 12 12 14 hours maybe longer um but it's it's really just having that having that space is beautiful and really to be with somebody and also um has been out of the seven um yeah it's it's three of them have that's been the only thing they've done with me the other four They've they've uh, either been existing clients or they've come on and we've, we've we've done the intensive and then we've done more work together because you know it's you hang out it's kind of like we're just hanging out but it's just the nature of the conversation is going to be a little bit different perhaps if they were just hanging out with a with a buddy um, and it's it it's it's a great way to develop um, that that relationship with somebody mm. yeah and. This is a really practical question, but I guess it's just in my mind. You know, when I guess no, let's catch first. Catch first the like. It is like hanging out with a buddy, but you've agreed. It's like this. There's, there's one really important difference, which is you've agreed that it's not going to be just like hanging out with a buddy because of why mm-hmm. you're there and all that kind of thing. And I can get, I got a feel that when you were talking about that for the shift that that creates, that it's like you might do loads of the things that you would do if you were just hanging out with a friend um, on the island for three days. But you've got this agreement that basically your 12, 14 hours of that will be these kind of slightly <laughs> odd conversations, but brilliant conversations that, that we might call coaching. Um, and some of that might be long. Yeah, I get that feel that just like in a 90 minute call, you know, there might be long periods of silence, but they will be like a couple of minutes which feels long in a call but if you expand that into 12 <laughs> hours that can be quite a nice nice yeah. silent walk yeah yeah beautiful um, what do you think the impact of being in an environment like that is and and we'll we'll put up a link to i mean we'll have a link to your website and the show notes so people who are um listening can like go and there's some great pictures on the and the little video of of that particular uh, island yeah. for people who don't know it on the on on your website it feels like there's something there must be something special about that that kind of environment and you obviously felt that when you were sitting on the bench and thinking i'd love to take someone there what do you think what difference do you think that environment particularly makes to the conversations that you have well personally for me my energy is different anyway so that will you know that will have to have an impact on the you know, the interaction that i'm having you know, i just think we're all in this big energetic soup anyway so uh you know if i'm if i'm vibrating differently or however like whatever language you want to use so i know that i'm i'm probably different there um the the, the difficult question is asking well in what way gosh i would say i mean to kinthos for, for whatever reason it feels like 
<laughs> Gosh, I could tear up here. I really love that island, right? So I am somewhere that I really love. So I'm I'm in the energy of love. And that's that's funny, too, actually. I've not really explored this. So thank you for the question. Not really explored this in this way, because I know that I can feel that energy anywhere. I can just be here on the call with you and, and still feel that. But there's something really expansive about being there, about being there. Um, probably here's the thing, though, because there's a danger. I think I, I love the question. And also it was an experiment. Yeah. Right. It, it was just an experiment. And I and I actually deliberately didn't create it as like an intensive where we're going to have this structure. You know, we're going to we're going to meet at 10 and I've brought in a yoga teacher and also a personal chef is going to come to us. And, and then we're going to do an hour's meditation in the afternoon. I just didn't want to do that. And that personal choice, because I know I know friends, in fact, who go on those kind of retreats and absolutely love it. So I think what I encourage, what I would love for anyone listening to take away from this is whatever it is you would love to do, whatever way you would love to spend time with a client. I got friends who have uh, climbed Kilimanjaro with clients, right? Uh, walk through the Welsh countryside. It's whatever for you, whatever like lights you up, whatever exactly that has you come alive. You can imagine being with a client under those circumstances, then I really encourage you to play with it because if that's something you really love, it is that energy that's going to move it forward. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully put, Phil. I think that the way you've told this story, um, you know, I think most people who are listening will have heard that lesson that you've just explained explicitly, implicitly in the story, just because of how this emerged. And, and it's like underneath it, there's, there's that even, yeah, there's the, there's the big, the bigger lesson, which is like you said, this profession is so diverse. We can essentially make up how we work and what we do. And that's really, really tough when you're starting out because you, you want to be told like the, how to, how to do it uh, to, and do it well. And, and, and yet really, and I think in some ways, maybe that's a lesson I, I learned from Rich's, Rich Lipman's community. I don't know if it's in the book was just like, Oh, right. I could just create like, any way of working with a client that I want to and experiment with it and see if it works. Like, oh, great. Well, and then, and then of course, what do you create? Well, you've just given a, a beautiful suggestion of how to do that. And yeah, again, I'm sure people felt the energy. I certainly did of like, there is something about that place for you, isn't there? And what a great thing to be able to share with people. And there's something also, isn't there about like, the people that will get the most out of that, that feel the energy from you when you talk about it are probably also the people that when they get there will be like, oh shit, this place. Yeah. I can't believe we're here. Um, yeah. 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 And 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 I think I want to I want to just highlight, shine a, a spotlight as well on this piece. I think I might have mentioned it in passing, is that some I know that I know this is the case with me because people have said it actually through all of my adult life. Um, as people have said to me, Phil, there's just something about being in your presence. So it took, it's taken me a while to, you know, we might say own that in quotes, but it's just really, I don't even know what that really means, Rory. What does it mean to own that? Well, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I am doing is like, okay, so I'm listening to that. And if, <laughs> if that's what the customer wants, that's what I'm going to give them. No, it's not really that. <laughs> Although there is, there is some truth in that. It's like, I know, okay, that that in and of itself can be worthwhile. And it, again, it comes back to that piece about um, <laughs> not trying to be somebody. So I guess where I am, like, I like myself more now. I mean, I'm like, I'm, I'm, 53 years old, at least it will be by the time this goes out. And uh, it's taken a long time. I can remember, I look, I look back at pictures of me when I was younger and think, yeah, look at him. Like he's kind of dishy and quite good looking. I wish he knew it. You know, he didn't really like mm. himself much. Like I wish I was as thin now as back then when I thought I was fat kind of thing. You know, it's just like all of that classic stuff that we all have going on to varying degrees. But I, it's, it's taken a long time, but I'm just like, I'm really comfortable with myself. So I'm realizing that like I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the people who are spending time with me an opportunity 
to have their experience of me. It, it is kind of that simple. Like this, this is me. I remember it's a, I was fortunate enough to spend uh, uh, some time with, with Steve Hardison, right. Who coached Steve Chandler for most of his life. And uh, what I really got from him is you, you can actually get paid just to be yourself, but trying to be yourself is not being yourself. It's really something we have to allow. So I can overthink the whole Zakynthos thing, right? Whereas really somebody might listen to this and in a way like, well, I just winged it because I did, right? And I just winged it. I had this idea and I just did it. It kind of reminds me of something I remember saying to one of my clients. I said to her, the difference between you and I is I'm just doing it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a... It's like an infuriating, but kind of profound thing to say. I think like, um, I don't know, do you think it's a, is it particularly a thing of this, of this age, of this day? It feels like it's common. Maybe it's just common because of the work I do and who I end up having conversations with this like, you know, gap between the thinking and the doing or the you know the sense that there's a whole load of people who who kind of know there's one of the secrets that helps at least has helped me have a happier life is just like doing things even though i feel scared or doing things even though they're not ready or, or just trying things that experimental thing of like okay I'll, I'll see if i can launch this group program now um because i happen to have three people here and then we'll see what happens and then <laughs> turns out in that one it, it ran its course with those three people and I never managed to, no, I did, I sold one more place on it and no one else turned up and, and I had a nice one-on-one -on -one engagement and it wasn't really a very good group program, right? In some ways, it was in others, you know, but the, that that shift is, is quite an important one, really. I'm just doing it and that's the difference, yeah. Yeah, to let go of all the other stuff, really just to let go of all of that. And I get it. It can be really, I remember it like, cause I'm catching myself now saying things that, um, I don't know, probably eight years ago, probably were really annoying to hear. <laughs> um, but, but, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it is something that, gosh, I am going to say it that when you get it, you get it, you know, and, and that's kind of the sort of a harsh truth to it. I think not, not necessarily harsh, but, but here's the thing I want to reiterate again. I'm noticing, so my coaching is probably all about presence. Um, and I know what people get from me is they get to experience what it's like to be in full loving acceptance of yourself and to love what it is to be human. And so, so much of the resistance that pretty much everyone entertains can fall away when you're in the energy of that kind of love and acceptance. Mm. And yet there are also coaches, a guy I met in Bali by the way, and uh, <laughs> he said to me, oh, so you're actually like a proper life coach because he was all business and strategy. And I think that's great. That's, that's not me. And I love that there are those coaches as well. And, and the, all the Tony Robbins gang, the rah, rah, and, and, and creating yourself and uh, constant never ending improvement and all of that. So again, beauty of the, beauty of the profession yeah. is is indeed that diversity there's no right or wrong way so here it is annoying annoying point number three thousand is that you really can you can choose you can choose and i think what's really important is people will connect to your heart as you've said like if they're if if it's a, a similar kind of heart compatible heart they'll just connect with that energy and it becomes super super easy because it's you it's you that they want to be with <laughs> there's also something like uh, i think i had this insight with a client once who was you know it, it was like going to a job interview and basically fretting about how to be at the interview and we basically plotted out on a on a quadrant like what happens if you are you and do get the job are you and don't get the job aren't you and do get the job and aren't you yeah. and do get the job whatever's left and yeah like one of the worst one of the absolute worst ones is perhaps the worst one is is you aren't you and then you get the job because then you might have to not be you forever <laughs> and it's the same with the client like 
<laughs> if you've just shown up and been you, then then you get this wonderful time where for the next six months or 12 months or, you know, three days on Zakynthos, you get to be you with full permission. You know, they're even paying you to do that. And you know that if you've kind of faked your way in, then that's going to, for me, that sounds a little, that's going to get edgy. Um, and, if, you know, we could talk for ages about those early stages and, and practicing and all that kind of thing. And of course you're finding, most people are finding their way, but I think it, I hope that people listening to what you say get that reassurance that actually like, yeah, it's a lot easier and more powerful and more exciting and I don't know, more transformational for the coach, probably more transformational for the client if if the coach is just 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 doing that beautiful being them. <laughs> well, I noticed and is that I think I had spent a long time um, <laughs> looking for the golden nugget you know, for the, for the silver key or whatever, and thinking there was something else that I needed. So I was consuming, 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 watching all the webinars and I'd be out walking, always listening. So I went, went through all those in Rich Litvin intensives and I would listen to the recordings of them on my, on my walks and stuff. And uh, I, again, there was uh, that whole business of, I was searching for a way of how I need to be. And um <clears throat> It is much simpler than that. Another annoying point, isn't it? It is much simpler than that. I think that's all natural. Like we we show we do that in all aspects of our life. There's a beautiful quote. Quote. I think I can't remember who said it, and I'm totally I'm totally going to butcher it as well. So totally paraphrasing it. Anyway, the gist the gist of it is that we spend our lives developing, um, like developing a cloak, a disguise, and then seek out somebody who will see through it and so i was like what's 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 the cloak what's the disguise i kind of need to wear whereas you really people say the answer's in you like what if you really could like you know what the things that you're passionate about in the world the things that you get excited about the things that you love in people like what if those people want to spend time with you and to just really allow yourself to connect with that, to really connect, like, it's funny, really, because probably pretty much every first conversation I have with clients, we talk about the two things that stop you getting what you want, which is being honest about what you want, and then remembering it, <laughs> called discipline, right? So, so being honest with what you want, but to me, doesn't, wouldn't everybody just love to, to be able to make a living in that zone of, of, of really being how they love to be with other people. And that totally is possible because that is, in my experience, that's what people are paying for. Mm. The authenticity of that. Mm. Uh, and maybe now is the time to kind of, you know, I'm aware there's probably bits of your story that we haven't touched on and that kind of thing, but you've kind of given us the way in now to what are you excited about? Like for you now, what are you excited about? What are the things that, that, you know, we talked about you and being you and spending time with people, but what are the things that you're excited about speaking to people about or. So I get opportunity to be really transparent now. So here's the thing, Robbie, uh, I had a really great year last year in my business. In fact, um, it was funny really being away in Bali had one of the best years I've, I've had. And so just, just say something quickly about Bali. Cause it, is this right? So you I, like a I'm, year and a half? I'm, I, yeah, I moved to Bali in October, 2019 with no firm plans, but I thought I'll probably be there for six months and then every 2020 kicked off. Right. And, um, so I didn't come back until, uh, June this year. So they have like 19 months or so just lived there fully immersed. Lived, I'd, I'd moved there. I'd sold up here and everything, got rid of everything. And, um, and yeah, had like my best year that I'd had for a while, man. And then, so stuff happened at a very late last year. I had a few clients sign up and paid like a year in advance. And um, and then, gosh, I mean, I had COVID in February. Um, and that actually, the effects of that probably lasted well into March. And once it got to March and April, I was like faffing about and trying to work out when do I or when do I not want to come back to the UK. So I'd say I feel like I've done very little <laughs> very little business development um i'm chuckling because to me when i look back at what's been going on in my business 
I, I, I can see there's one constant and that's my energy, the energy of my relationship with my business. Right. And, uh, I did some work um, a couple of years ago, a few sessions with um, Melissa Ford. And um, she asked me this beautiful question. If your business was your romantic partner, how would you describe your relationship? I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's totally inadequate. I'm not really all in either. And stuff. It's like, what a beautiful way to look at it. And, and like last year, it was just really easy. I was grateful. It was just beautiful, really enjoying it. And the first half of this year, I've been a bit like, yeah, like I haven't recorded any podcast episodes this year. So um, it's funny you ask me, what am I excited about? It's like the truth of the matter is right now, I, I'm like, I'm coming out of that meh cycle my energy has changed just over probably the last month because it took me a while to adjust to get come back into the uk um and just me being on here talking to having this conversation is another example of what can happen with the energy of you know with just that shift in energy people talk about law of attraction i much prefer to use the term law of creation right rather than attraction so I know it's like I'm getting my new workstation here all set up. Uh, there's this little workspace, whatever, how I, how, I, how I like it. And then I get an email from you. Hey, would you like to come on my podcast? So to me, that's like the perfect example. So what, I'm, what am I excited about? I don't really know, but I'm feeling excitement swelling in me of just like getting back in the game a little bit mm-hmm. because obviously I've continued to work with some existing clients, but I, I've kind of been out of it for a little while. You know, I've been out here a little while, hence not recording any podcast episodes at all this year. And, and yeah, I love this. I love talking, talking about this profession. And, and yeah, I know I've, I've pretty got a lot to give both just in one-on-one clients, but just to the profession as a whole. So I'm actually excited to, <laughs> to come back. I, I can't give you like this really, oh, I've got this particular project going on. I'd be ex- I'm excited at the thought that maybe travel restrictions will ease up and I can go back to Zakynthos perhaps in September, October, who knows, but right now there aren't any firm plans. I'm just feeling, yeah. Do you know, what? after quite a bumpy ride this year, it's quite a change to, you know, go through COVID and that kind of stuff and then move across the other side of the world again. Um, it's like, okay, settle down a bit now um, and, and getting back in, getting back in. Have you noticed that kind of cycle happened before in over the oh, last, gosh, yeah 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 yeah, I, yeah. Think, I just think it's kind of important to highlight that like that, that those cycles of energy happen because especially because well and it's like it would have been really lovely to have had this conversation actually if you were in the middle of that meh period as well because it would have been really different it yeah. been, it, probably it'd have been really interesting but it's you know i think i can feel that your your energy is is in that place that you just described but it can be easy when we're having that conversation we're both in that and i'm in, a, in that place a little bit as well so it's like when we've both got that energy it can be easy to forget and people can get that impression that there is never the meh period where you don't really know what the hell's going on why you're doing this work or, or what you're going to make or or anything like that so yeah what <laughs> i guess this might be too kind of glib a question but what like what have you learned over the years from those cycles of meh followed by the energy coming back and getting back in the game yeah i think well, of, of my own podcast i'm not meant to i'm not really deliberately um yeah promoting it but if if i had to pick out let's uh, deliberately just, promote uh, it in a minute i want to talk about uh, it in yeah, a yeah. But, but, <laughs> but okay but but having said that like what comes to mind is a guy who, who uh matt watkins i did um steve chandler's uh, acs with him and his his um he he he, he describes what he he learned the hard way that we have to embrace he's american so he says you got to embrace the suck that's it you got to embrace the suck and 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 is uh, uh, again another podcast I was listening to is this guy Aaron Turner who was talking on Rohini Ross and Angus Ross's podcast, and he says he 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 um, he knows when somebody's like new to a particular understanding that he talks about about life because these the newcomers think they're going to beat the system, they think they're going to beat the system. Which what I've got from what what I think he means there is he think they're going to beat the system of life, like life is ebb and flow, life is excited and melancholy right it, it, it's so we're not going to beat that so 
again, part of loving being human. And I, I'm like, God, Robbie, I love being human more than I ever have. <laughs> I meet people like, oh my God, there's another one, another human being. I want to <laughs> hug you. This is a tough gig, right? This is a tough gig. Come on. Like, so I can, I feel really much more connected with like everyone now, just simply through this process of not, not resisting that. And yes, of course, there is always things you can do in your business to build it, to move it forward. But as far as I can tell now, like I say, been on the planet 53 years and I've been on what we might call a spiritual journey. Gosh, what, what a phrase. But anyway, I've been like looking into spirituality and stuff since 1998 when, you know, a marriage broke down and I thought, what the hell happened? I want to see if I can avoid such utter despair before. And I learned since that it's not really possible. To, to try and transcend this human experience. So, and, and really the same applies with your business. So great. Awareness is, is probably your greatest ticket to move things forward. But part of the awareness is what it is to be human is to have days where it feels meh yeah, and other days where I'm like, oh my God, I'm so excited about this. And there might be nothing different. There might be nothing different about that. And as I said, there have been times where um, I had like this relationship breakup a few years ago, 2017. Before that, it felt like everything I touched turned to gold. And um, and I had periods of, of like that since. And then other periods of like, oh my God, when, it, when is the next paying client actually going to come? You know? But I noticed the, the, the common factor is my relationship with what I'm doing. And that's okay, just to simply accept that. Just, I've noticed that if I'm feeling down, if I'm not feeling excited, it never helps to berate myself for that. Hmm. Hmm. I think in a minute, I maybe want to come back to something around relationships with ourselves and with others, because that feels like, you know, as I've headed this, conversation looked into your work it feels like there's a big theme there I don't want to miss that but before we do though let's I'd love to talk about your podcast a bit more we can we can promote it deliberately I love that like I love <laughs> you know and I think about like <laughs> it's funny isn't it I you know I was aware as, as I was preparing for this interview I was aware like like that a part of me was going oh shit I'm like I'm just all my listeners are just going to go and listen to Phil's show instead because because it's only like half as long. And so so all the people that hate the fact that these conversations go on for two hours will just be able to go and like get a really nice 48 minute conversation, all that kind of thing, those thoughts. And then, of course, the, the you know, the, the bigger or wiser or more loving parts of me goes, oh, great you know, love, absolutely love it. If all the people who love this show get to go and find <laughs> Phil's and suddenly discover this treasure trove of amazing conversations with, with beautiful people, like what a wonderful thing to do. Um, yeah. But I wonder if to start us off, like where did that come in, in your journey? Like how did it come about? And like, I wondered if, I think I heard a, like a hint that this might've been the case in, in, in one of the episodes I listened to, but the, you know, the kind of thing you say at the start of every episode is that you're gonna peel back the bull crap and brush away the Photoshopping to give an unfiltered look as uh, what it's like to live as a coaching, a coaching life. So I was yeah. also wondering, tell us about where it came from, but I was also wondering, oh, did it right. come from like seeing a lot of bull crap and Photoshopping and, and thinking that someone needed to do something about that? I went to got, um, uh, what I say, mm, scolded, shall we say, by somebody that I love and respect um, for calling out um, the person um, that was in my life that inspired the podcast, all right? Because there's a, a somewhat very well-known mentor of mine. <laughs> Whereas I kind of feel like, like, why am I defending? I don't know. It's like... Does it really matter? Well, we've all done things. I've certainly done things that have been inauthentic. Um, I was having a conversation with a client just last week about how perhaps perhaps our most authentic thing would be to share how inauthentic we are. Perhaps that really would be authentic. Anyway, digress slightly. So um, without naming names, because maybe it's unfair, or there's a bit of me that says, yeah, but come on, Phil, you've like you've communicated with him about it. You've even invited him on the podcast cars and all this kind of stuff 
one of my mentors, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to work out who it was. I went to uh, one of his events and um, I, there was stuff that happened at the particular event. Um, I was like a, a leader at this event. So it was like there were breakout groups that I was leading and there was some stuff that happened at this event. Anybody who was there will, will know what I was talking about. And it just felt off what was what was being said and reasons that were given they just felt off we were like oh come on that's not really it come on why don't you just tell us how it how it is right and that was kind of off and then at, at the same event this guy comes and speaks to me and says, i feel do you want to, do you want to talk I'm like, yeah sure why so well, i heard you were upset about what happened yesterday Sorry, is this the is this the mentor coming up and saying this or somebody yeah yeah, yeah 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 he comes up to me well, you know what 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 um heard you were upset yesterday I'm like oh yeah I kind of what I was upset but then I had a little bit of a walk down to Santa Monica Pier and I just I imagined having a conversation with you and I imagine you saying you know Phil sometimes you've got to be willing to piss a few people off to achieve something extraordinary and he really liked this he really liked this it's a great great story would you mind repeating it on microphone so uh, I've never told this story in this much detail before by the way but um, so I'm like, yeah, I repeated it on microphone in the room and uh, just to demonstrate, well, there was some truth in that. It's like, maybe sometimes you do have to piss a few people off to uh, achieve something extraordinary. And, and that was just, I, I'd let go of it and I was no longer upset. And like people in my team, I was relaying the same thing to me as like, yeah, I get it. I could sense the inauthenticity there and it didn't feel entirely in integrity what had gone on. And that was it. And that was the end of it. And it, and but once I started looking through this lens of, yeah, this guy, things aren't all that they seem to be. Once I started looking in that direction, I started uncovering more and more stuff uh, that also wasn't how it appeared. And then I came across some videos and this guy had just embellished a little bit that whole situation so that he kind of looked like he was like really leading and more powerful. And it got so that telling a story that you know i'd called him up because i was I, you know i was just i had this dream about him just these little twists that, that to me it doesn't look like mm. so i said i sent i sent him a message an email just personal email address and said I, I just found this like distasteful like come on that wasn't really what happened what, what's that all about and uh then i i got kicked out of the community i got blocked on facebook and so i was then pretty upset because i had spent tens of thousands of pounds dollars in to and fro into the us and whatever with this and i really upset tried tried the texting and i've tried numerous times since to reconnect and they come on this would be really good to talk about because we've all done stuff you know we've all done stuff and i think this would be really great to get this guy on the podcast yeah and um <laughs> what what i what i discovered i was going through this period of time of like looking for the shit in this profession, right? Looking for the embellishment because you know we want to prove that what we've seen is really happening. Like, is this really? Is this guy really doing this stuff? So I started, you know, people were connected with me. Oh yeah, similarly blocked me on Facebook as well, and blah 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 blah, and this kind of stuff. And it, like, right, this felt rubbish at this time. This was over a period of months, by the way, and my business was going down. Right, talk about energy, and then outside of the apartment I lived in at the time, it overlooked a uh, college, community college. And there was this big banner put on the wall with, with my all time favorite quote. And it says, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. Mahatma Gandhi. Oh shit. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Shit. Mahatma was right uh, so, say, yeah. yeah. I keep coming back to that quote. So, I mean, that's yeah. it really, isn't it? And I just realized in that moment, okay, so let's create something that instead of all of that Photoshopping and the, uh, uh, the white, the, sorry, the black shiny pointed shoes and stuff, let, let's just show how it really is. And, and hence that is why that's always been my intention. Like I have had periods, like I say, of everything I've touched that seems to turn to gold and times where Oh shit, where's the next client coming from? And that seemed to be life. Whereas so I deliberately won't have anyone on my podcast who's not willing to expose that aspect, you know, of what it is to be human. Um, and they've all been pretty much all been great guests. But anyway, that's that's the story behind it. I wanted to really do something different and split because so here's the crux of it. It was it's really this. 
in the same way as I think it's unhealthy for us to aspire to a photoshopped body image. I think it's really unhealthy and unhelpful to aspire to a photoshopped image of this profession and what it takes to be a coach. And I can tell you that like I, all the time people talk to me and like so-and-so seems to have it together. I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of privileged because I have a lot of conversation with people behind the scenes. And I can tell you that no one has it together. Like no one totally has it together. So please, let's just let go of that idea. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so what's then, what's important? You know, I mean, part of it is making a show where that can be exposed. But it's quite hard <laughs> to hold that balance. Right. And like, I had this thought a little bit reading your website. So I'm really glad you've said that stuff. And, you know, it was interesting. I was listening to one of your podcasts and you said you'd done seven of the island retreats because the member of the community, like I said, wanted me to ask you about the island retreats. And I suddenly thought, you know, it wouldn't be totally out of the realm's possibility for a coach to end up with a page about island retreats on their website, having never run an island retreat. <laughs> and so it was really good to hear on the podcast. I was like, great. Phil has actually run these island retreats, but it didn't, you know, it's, there we go. It's like, there's what happens if you have a lot of essentially photoshopping of the profession that I actually don't know if um, you've run the island retreats that that it kind of says you right. would run on your website and that's yeah, that, that's true yeah. because I've had stuff on my website sometimes like which says here's this thing I'm gonna do and then at some point in the future if I decide that's not a thing I'm gonna do anymore that page disappears usually but there'll be a period between me saying I'm gonna do it it not happening or stopping happening. There's, there's a group program actually on there now, which I'm probably not going to run again. I haven't put any energy in, into it for a while, but I haven't taken the page down yet. And so if someone asks me about it, it's the slightly weird thing. Similarly, it's like when we, <laughs> like, I, and I noticed your bio does this, mine does it. It's like, you know, I, my clients have included dot, dot, dot. And then you name the six coolest kind of clients that you can of think course. of. And, yeah. and it's like, you know, and my clients have included, you know, my, I really liked actually that in one of your books that I was reading part of, you know, you talked about some of the stories, client stories that you love the most. And they weren't like Hollywood actor, CEO of whatever. I mean, they might have been, I can't remember, but the one that I remember was about like Went a girl. to space. Exactly. The one I loved was like a girl who sang in public. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Having not been able yeah. to before. And like one of my yeah. absolute favorite all time Speech Marks clients was a woman who never paid me. She just did the gift session that I was offering at the start of the enrollment process. But it was like the mo one of the most courageous things I'd ever seen for this woman to come and 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 sit with a stranger in a, you know, I can feel it now, like in a in a in a publicish space with me. But it was absolutely one of the most inspiring things I've ever seen, and it's way better than the like. <laughs> You know, I absolutely love the uh, MD of, a, of an investment fund who, you know, he was an absolutely amazing client. He's on my website and testimonials, right? Because he wrote me a beautiful testimonial. And, you mm -hmm. know, it's like, mm -hmm. I love them both, but that both of them, you know, are equally as important to me. I guess, you know, I'm just talking really, but there probably is a question in here, which is something like, how do we tow that line? You know, because if, if, mm -hmm. if, I agree, right? I want to be the, the leader, you know, this podcast wants to be the same thing that yours wants to be, really. It wants to be a place where we have actual conversations about actual life as a coach, you know, which includes the struggles and all that kind of stuff, as well as the wonderful retreats um, on, on Zakynthos or wherever. And my intention has always been, and it's partly been accidental, but it's partly been deliberate to be, you know, be authentic, but in a real way. <laughs> Not in a like Photoshop yeah. way, but like, how do we yeah. tread that line between selling skillfully, I guess, is part of it and, you know, right. showing people what's possible and not Photoshopping. I guess it's don't delete someone off Facebook because they like call you out for, <laughs> for making up a bullshit story about what happened, like, or don't make up a bullshit story about what happened. Those are both, both sound like good lessons to take from this, but well, you know, you hear what I'm asking really, or you hear the energy. Yeah, what, for what, sure. What do you for sure. To, yeah. Do you yeah. And I, and I, and I spent a long time a bit confused about it also. Right. Because, um, here, like, so I have the clients that also talk about perhaps sharing what's going on with them. So uh, look, it is a game. We're playing this game. 
right? Because <clears throat> the only reason somebody's going to hire me is if they think that their life's going to get better in some way or other, right? I want to, oh, again, I start getting excited. I just get excited. This is, this is really key, by the way. Like, yeah. you ask me why I do this. It's because I can instantly get excited about what's possible for people. Right? That's that's there. It's so ingrained. Like, I love this. I love this work. What, I want to catch up on this. It's really people, important. Mm -hmm. that, like, it's just so important that you say that because people listening will think, might think, yeah, me too. Um, but no one should ever forget that not everyone gets excited about what's possible for other people. Like it's really right. important to remember that, that like That's I remember being it. I remember yeah. being the only friend of one of my friends who got super for some weird reason he was moving to a city in the states and maybe it wasn't the coolest city or something but I was the only one who was like holy shit this is gonna be amazing and it, you know it was it was quite a thing for him to hear that I guess so mm -hmm. I just wanted to catch that because I think that's a really important thing that that many coaches will probably share with you not all but many. And it's easy to forget that not everyone gets excited about the possibility for other people. But sorry, Phil, that's, I interrupted you to, you know. Uh, yeah, I can, I was just, just acknowledging and like, noticing that excitement as soon as I start to think about it. So, so this is the key of it, I think, is that, yeah, what's possible for other people. So I will be doing them a disservice, right, if I put things in the way of them experiencing me in a way that helps them get what they want. All right. So, uh, in fact, uh, um, John John P. Morgan talked about this as well in the in the second episode, I think it was that I did with him on my podcast. So, another unintentional plug. <laughs> Sorry, and I didn't Maybe quite let you do the intentional plug. Yeah. Well, let's, we'll, let's but, do an actual intentional but, uh, plug in a minute. But like, you go on. What but but it's just like he, because I, I was kind of having this conversation with him as well. Because I get it that I was a bit confused about it, but I he articulated it in a way which I can't really remember. It just helped me to like. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? It's just like, so this is my this is my metaphor, by the way, is that if 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 I might be able to help you, and we never really know, but if I might be able to help you, but you have a phobia of motorbikes and Darth Vader, then I'm not gonna come and bring my invite for us to have a conversation dressed as Darth Vader on a motorbike, right? I'm just simply not gonna do that. Right. Even though by working with me, you might get over that phobia. You might get over that phobia and therefore it's OK. So I, I, I want to present myself in a way that has you come and sit in front of me so that we get the opportunity to explore. I don't want to put things in the way of that. And if that means that you look at me as if I'm on some pedestal, that's the bit that feels a bit uncomfortable to me. It's not an intentional thing, but I'm just like, I'm not going to show you all this shit really, at least not until you are in front of me. <laughs> I'll show some because I am all about that. Just showing what it is to be human. Right. And, and I think your particular audience will appreciate this, but like, if, if I believe that I should have it all together, I want to, I'm going to be drawn to somebody who at least appears to have it together at least for that conversation. And I'm not saying there's a right and wrong, because even in exploring this, it doesn't feel like there's a black and white line here at all. But I think the crux of it is for me that, you know what, I, I don't really mind what you believe if it gets you here. If it gets you here in front of us, because then we're going to explore and none of that stuff will appear relevant. Now, I'm careful. I don't want to lie. And I don't, I'm, I'm kind of fortunate in, in that most of my clients, most of them, and I know that newcomers hate to hear this, most of them do come via referral. And again, that energetic thing, right? After this shift just last month. So I had, had nothing, nothing at all earlier this year because everything else that was going on. And then there was this kind of shift in me, started getting excited a month ago. Somebody I'd worked with previously sent me a voice message on WhatsApp. Hey, Phil, I've got this going on. Can we look and can we start doing something and just start working with me again, right? I didn't do anything. <laughs> just, just that shift in energy. So just that piece, How do, I don't know that we can really square it off. I'm, I'm not really cautious. I, I'm aware, right? I don't, I'm not going to spin a yarn. And, and, and that's the thing that, you know, that, that did bring the podcast about. There would look like a, there's just a twist there. Just look, that's unnecessary. There was some stuff that was just really unnecessary. Even people that might say, hey, I've just bought a million pound house when really they're renting it, right? That kind of thing. 
that's like no not going to do that but there's only a few people that i would share even though I share here it's like i've been okay with it i've been okay with it. i haven't had any new clients yet this year and now i'm like well now i'm ready again and then you know one came along for example last month and I think there's just that important point. That's it. I don't want to deny people the opportunity to <laughs> experience something amazing, which not, not just with me, but coaching in and of itself is amazing. That's why we're in this profession. That's why it just excites me. So I don't, I don't want to put stuff in the way of that and, until you can see that that's just, that becomes irrelevant. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think it's a good, it's, pro, it's, it's probably a really good frame to make those choices through. It's like, am I, you know, I think it's a good one, you know, often, I, I don't know if you found this too, but often when, you know, when people are just starting out in a business like this, it's it's actually the other way. It's like, you know, it's actually not the saying too much shiny stuff than, than is real. It's, it's like withholding some of the uh, not sh well shiny shining maybe if we're gonna do a cheesy cheesy uh, alternative <laughs> thing shining stuff that is actually real and it's like well if you're not telling people about this this stuff that makes up who you are because you haven't got a website because you're too afraid of having a website you're denying them the chance to do this amazing thing actually potentially yeah, so it could yeah, be a, good, yeah. a good frame if you scroll through my Facebook, there's there's not much I won't share. Like if you scroll back to, I don't know when it was, was it January or December last year? There's a video I was going to interview. Um, Nathan Siebel is on my podcast. <laughs> <I> keep mentioning. <laughs> Honestly, it's totally unintentional. But anyway, <laughs> I, was, I, was just, <laughs> I was interviewing him for my podcast. We'd arranged this time and, I'd, and I lost it on the call with him because I just break up with my girlfriend at the time and i just i was just in tears and he's just said, what about if you release this bit yeah so i did so there's that there's this grown man crying and having to like bring his planned interview to a close because i want to show you look this is real this is what i like there's uh i uh, come on look i like fart humor so i made a post just i don't know a couple of weeks ago on my wall and um this is a great way of filtering it out like if you're going to work with me you're going to have to have a sense of humor, right? Because I want it to be fun for you and me, right? I want it, I want it to be fun. So if you kind of take things a bit seriously, then you probably, I'm not for you. I'm really not for you. And there was somebody there's like on, on this post, I, I, I'd asked, I had this thought or occurred to me. It was like, is it okay to fart loudly on a silent retreat? I just thought that thought was hilarious. So I posted that on Facebook because I want to show people, this is me. Like I give, give people an opportunity to get to know you right facebook's wonderful about that you can give people an opportunity to get to know you so that you can show up with them and just be you right it becomes effortless and one person commented on that and just said well i think the answer is grow up and i'm like well i've got no intention to do that and she said you disgust me and off she went unfriended i'm like great thank you yeah. like, thank you thank you for leaving like clearly not my people right and so, yes, we don't we don't post pictures of our poop or kind of thing. Of course, right? But there is this element about being real, and and I and I I would love it if you if you've listened to my podcast. And actually, it's it's not it's 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 not an unfamiliar story. Like a, a few clients that have come to me. Oh, I've read your books. I've listened to your podcasts and and stuff. So I, I already feel like I want to hire you. I already feel like I know you. So then it just becomes about me getting to know them. Because I put in, my, in I put enough stuff out there for people to at least get a sense of who I am and what I'm about. So there aren't really any surprises, and and I and and so I then find it becomes effortless, effortless. Yeah, yeah. and again, it, it becomes effortless because in all the places you're being you. Um, again, if you were being the shiny you, then it might get pretty awkward when someone meets you and they're like, wait a minute, this isn't how you felt in your books or in your podcast. Something's, something's weird. Let's do, Bill, let's do the, the explicit plug of the podcast. So okay. you know, I can tell you some, I can tell you some, um, you know, anyone who wants to can, can find the coaching life on all the places. Um, and of course, a, a good thing to do, like with any podcast is you can find a guest that you've, you know, and would like to already, um, listen to a conversation with um steve chandler who we've mentioned is on there jamie smart who we've mentioned is on there there are there are Karen, carolyn freya jones who you mentioned is on there there are lots of other people as well 
if you were to recommend, obviously people could start at the beginning, which would be a kind of normal oh. way to start, but um, you've mentioned that those are cringeworthy. If you were to send people to your favorite episode, where would you send people? Uh, <laughs> or a favorite episode, obviously. You don't want to uh, 69. Away. 69. Episode 69. This is the one I did on my own, just having a bit of a rant on my own. There you go. It's like I don't know if there was like five or six essentials to building a coaching life. There you go. Because I don't want to call out again. I've loved in, in various ways. I was going to say I loved them all. There are a couple that I have felt, mm, I don't know. I don't know about that one. I didn't enjoy that quite as much. And I put them out there and they've still got like good feedback and whatever. And I'm still getting emails pretty much every week someone to be emailing me just today somebody emailed me listen to your podcast loved it whatever it's still that's still going on so if somebody wants to just go and listen gosh it, I, it's an unanswerable question Robbie it really is and, and and if you've got no idea just pick one at random and if you didn't like it then please just give another episode half a chance because you know that the guests are very diverse and quite different you know um I would say like just in the interest of transparency, like for example, Steve Chandler, I thought I'm not going to have Steve Chandler on my podcast. I'm not, I'm not going to invite him because I just want the, like he's been in the game so long, all of his stuff's out there. I've read, you know, probably most of his 30 odd books and whatever. And, and like anybody who's listened to this podcast, they're probably already aware of him. Right. I wanted to get something different. There's a bit of this with Jamie as well. Oh, that's when I get Jamie on whatever. And um, I thought, no, I'm going to. Let's see if I can get something different. Now, I wasn't disappointed would be too strong a word, right? Because it was a beautiful experience. Just again, once again, having a conversation with Steve, connecting with him, that lovely dry sense of humor. And there's not really anything new in that podcast episode. And I kind of think, will he mind me saying that? Actually, he won't give a shit. Right. So um, there isn't anything new in that. And I, I, so I really wanted to get something new. But there's loads of value. Like there's that's all Steve Chandler, so that's enough value. You see what I mean, right? Yeah, and the same, the same like with Jamie Smart. Like I really felt I want to know what's the Jamie like behind the coaching. I felt like I was getting a crowbar out, like towards the end of that episode. Come on, Jamie. That's why I think I asked him, "How would your friends describe you?" And I don't think he couldn't really answer it. You know what I mean? So, um, whilst so my experience of that. Of, of having those conversations would be very different from the listener's experience. That's my point here really is that how I felt listening to those, I don't know. I can't say I can tell you this. I tell you the one episode I've had the most feedback about funny enough, you talk about going to my podcast for shorter episodes is the longest one. That one is nearly two hours with Dominic Scafidi. Right. And that's, that's the one where I started getting like close to 2000 downloads for episodes and stuff. And, uh, and yet it's the longest one. It was one that I considered chopping into two and it's a great episode. And it's very much around like law of attraction stuff, law of creation. He's Dominic's had emails from people who have listened to that. I think seven times. <laughs> so maybe you go and listen to that one, but also listen to Amir, listen to the one with Matt Watkins who, tried coaching and then went back into a job and whatever, because like, you're going to learn like success. I think can I mention Bill Gates is such an anti Bill Gates brigade nowadays, but anyway, what the hell Bill Gates apparently said, I agree with him on this, at least success is a very poor teacher. Yeah. Success is a very poor teacher. So actually I'm, I'm, I'm looking for coaches that I can talk to in a way that are like have failed along the way, failed their way to success. So like there's, there's a good few examples of those. And then there's another, there's another one. Um, oh my gosh, I'm in a senior moment. Which I think it's also Melissa, but I'm so sorry, Melissa. I can't remember your surname. Gosh, who uh, I loved how she approached it. She was like really forthright. She was the only guest I've had on, by the way, who came via an agency. She had an agency approach me. I don't know about you, Robbie. I'm getting probably three emails a week from agents. Like got this super guest and um, I didn't get any of them on. I have a little browse, but it's not really what I'm after. But uh, the way this particular agent approached me, it was very personal. Mm. She had clearly done some done some homework and had actually listened to the podcast, which I'm sure most of them don't, and suggested this guest. And I was really curious, like, wow, okay. And Melissa was a great guest. And I loved how she, like, she called into a radio station. Here we are, we're talking about, like, in a way, faking it until you make it or whatever. But she said, 
I'm going to take your slot. I'm this coach. I want to, I want this regular slot on the radio. So she kind of presented herself in a way as like the coaching expert for that morning radio slot. And it, and it kicked off a whole load of stuff. And I think, yeah, she's in a way how she put it. She wasn't, she wasn't lying. She wasn't even economical with the truth. Right. But she was stepping into what she wanted to be. She was really stepping into what she wanted to be. And that gave loads of people an opportunity to experience coaching and experience her. So I hope that helps for those two topics back. Definitely does. One of the episodes as a, as a skillful bridge, one of the episodes that I enjoyed listening to is certainly a friend of yours or maybe a friend of mine. When do we become friends with people? Brenton Hughes, um, which oh, is yeah. a really interesting yeah. episode because Brenton's a client of yours and that's what you talk about. And so you get some of, some of that sense from um, he's able to, because of the special guy he is to kind of really talk nicely about the experience of a client. And also of course, to bring lots of um, insight himself. Um, so people can definitely check that out. And that allows us perhaps to, to loop back to right near the start when you mentioned Robert Holden. And I heard a really mm. nice thing. It might've been in that episode that you said about going to one of Robert Holden's events. And maybe, I don't know if this is true. I might be, if this isn't true, you know, may, I'm imagining now that it might've been just after you'd come out of this experience with the, with the, the other mentor you had, because you talk about having been in an other kind of coaching events and then going to one of Robert's and yeah. being like, oh, this is different. Yeah. And I wonder if you could just say say something about <laughs> that and about maybe his impact, Robert, that is impact on on you or 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 your work. Yeah, gosh, it's just funny. I think the contrast as well teaches us, mm. right? So I never I never genuinely wanted to live a life in the way it appeared the previous mentor was living mm. right even though there was a bit of me that felt oh i need to take on board some of that in order to create the success that i wanted and clearly that that was totally baloney total baloney so, so i did my last event with them and then yeah three days later i did my first robert holden event and then suddenly there's this guy who's like instead of hiding at the back of the room at lunchtime was, was there and he was dancing to Stevie wonder with you. And it's just so warm and loving and making inappropriate jokes about boobs that actually were quite appropriate. And it's just, just being really human, like just being really human. I'm like, wow, there's this guy, this was like a Hay house event. It was in San Diego. There's like a hundred people in the room and and there is just him and i've been to a few of his workshops since and he's just so so approachable so warm in fact i would i feel like i feel like he's a friend and and um to me and you know, had me on had him on the podcast i think around a, quite a long time ago episode 14 or something where he spoke about bringing love into business so for me like there are <clears throat> There are people who are perhaps chasing success, chasing happiness, chasing money. Whereas with, with Robert, it was all about, it's all about love. And let's face it, if we're experiencing love, what else really matters? Like that, ev that event for me, it was five days. It was called coaching success. We take five days out of our life to explore what was success for us. And not many people do that perhaps in any point in their life. Right. So I was fortunate to do it then. And of course, at the start, people have varying ideas about what that is. But at the end of the five days, it was like, yeah, that's being with our loved ones. That was it. That was all, all we really wanted. And there's that theme there, you know, if you read the book, Five, five Regrets of the Dying, same kind of thing. The impact on me, there's so much, so much impact on me. It, it, it was like that in itself was a homecoming, which when we sort of think about love, that kind of makes sense as well. Whereas I also know that for some people, oh, it's the rah rah, the seven figures. Um, if that if that genuinely turns you on, great. Like I know, let's 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 look at um, you know those two gentlemen that we've mentioned, Rich Litvin and Steve Chandler at that that, that event. Right. And I did those rich living events and then went to the Steve Chandler school for me. I know there are people who went through Rich's event, which was for PC. And that was all about you 
you being in the top 4% of coaches on the planet, right? Now, that was an aspiration. That was people who aspire to that. That was the aspiration. And for whatever reason, right? But that didn't vibe with me. Whereas if we look at that, that was Richard's signature program at the time. And I'm not actually knocking it. I'm just saying, go with what vibes with you. That is my message here. If that's like, I want to be one of the top 4% on the planet, great. But I, for me, I just loved what Steve describes. In fact, his signature program at the time was called ACS, Advanced Client Systems. So the focus was all about the client. It was all, all, all about the client. How can you serve the client? How can you serve the client? Now, I don't know if that was what was going on behind those doors with Rich, whether that was, of course, I know Rich is all about service and stuff, but it's just even that focus, even that focus. I remember saying to a client of mine last year, you know what, every single thing I do, every single thing I do is for me. Because mm-hmm. that's true for all of us. But that's not where my focus is. So I'm just going to let that go. I'm just going to let that go as a given. It is really ultimately for me, but that's not where I'm going to put my focus. I'm going to put my focus on serving people. And, allow, and, and I've noticed that my energy is of service to people. And I love that. I love I love just that. Yeah, and there is something. I've just finished. Um, the reason I know Brenton reasonably well now is I've just finished doing Robert's Success Intelligence Mastermind. Like, uh, oh. like last call was like, what, what day is it? Like, like last week. So I really just finished it, or two weeks ago. And so I've been really, you know, it's been a very interesting time to be in his space. You know, just like that's what it that's what it felt like to me when I was kind of reflecting on it. I was like, what have I got from this program? And I was just like, well, what a beautiful thing to be immersed in um, over this last six, seven months. And there's been lots going on in my life. For example, a baby has been going on in the last seven months. So it's like I was like, well, what a beautiful thing to be. That's partly why I went. Right. Because I knew it was happening. But it's like to be immersed in that. Yeah, that very particular well, maybe not particular, but a, a very beautiful kind of feel. And there is a, I get that sense of homecoming. And for people who, I mean, there's lots of ways you could get into Robert's work, but I don't know. I think that because love feels like it's so much part of his work now, I, I probably send people to lovability. Is that, is that where you send them? Or That's one of my favorite books. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Lovability. I love that. You know, he's our, he, in a workshop, he, he asked one question that um, I've all, kind of already touched on. What's it like to be you? when you're not trying to be anybody <laughs> and I will add not even trying to be yourself right because that's just an idea that's just to somebody so what's it like to be you when you're not trying to be somebody and to me and everybody I've repeated that question too I said it's just liberating it's so free yeah it's just so free yeah. so I know for me I've become a much more impactful coach helpful coach enjoyable coach by no longer trying to be a coach Hmm. so it's kind of one maybe one more thing that i want to ask you about and and then and then maybe just to kind of bring in to bring the conversation to a close and it's something i hinted at before really is this well maybe it maybe it relates to what we just said because we've been talking about love but you in this conversation and previously, you've talked about relationships a lot. And I think it's on one of your headlines or something is, is the word relationship is central on your website or, or, or something like that. You know, you talked about how in the work you do, your relationship with what you're doing is one of the most important things. Um, and in one of the, I kind of asked some questions of guests to kind of get some talking points. And one of them that you gave was, you know, is, is the essence of coaching, or maybe for you, the essence of coaching is changing people's relationships with themselves. And I'm also aware, it's going to be a big question. I don't know what the question at the end of this is going to be. <laughs> you know, you've also mentioned relationship, your personal relationship struggles. That's like in your story that you share with people. Um, yeah, I guess I just wonder as I bring that into the call now, into this conversation, like, why do you think relationships have relationship relationships have have become so central in in your work or have 
been so central in your life? If, if that's the right question. And if it's not, Phil, answer a better one. <laughs> oh, great. I'm going to steal that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, how it looks to me is that is what life is, relationships. Okay. It's just that's all life re- exists of. My relationship with my significant other, um, my relationship with myself, my relationship with my work, my relationship, yeah, with, with you it's it's that's that's all it is my relationship and and i just i guess i don't know it just came into my awareness of just looking that way in a roundabout way because i went through this exploration of perhaps wanting to change these individual parts of my life so i wanted to change my work i really had to change my relationship with work except I didn't when we come to that. So I think, and, and, and in a way, this also relates to that point about what we want to do is we want to, this is what Jamie Smart says, says, thank you, Jamie. Never paid him a dime, but I've learned so much from him. Um, Same, he actually. says, you want to oh, maybe I bought participate. One of his books, okay. <laughs> oh, I have actually, oh, thank you. I feel better about myself now. I have bought his books. Um, he says, you want to participate and join in the conversations that people are already having in their heads. So nobody is sitting at home thinking, oh, I wish I was in touch with my true self. Right. Or indeed nobody's really having using the language. Oh, I, I really wish I was in touch with love more. Right. They're, they're probably saying, God, I, I, I wish I didn't get such a hard time from my husband or I wish I found it easier to communicate with my son or, you know, gosh, you know, why haven't I got the next pay rise or the next promotion or whatever, a number of things like, but ultimately all we've got (laughs) is our relationship with our experience of life. So I can like pitch, if you want pitch, my coaching is I will help you change your relationship with your with your parents or your children or your boss or whatever, but I'm actually only ever going to change, help you change your relationship with your experience of life of those things. So I'm going to change your relationship with your thinking because that's where your experience is coming from. So I'm really only going to change your relationship with you and from that, everything else, but nobody is sitting at home saying, Oh, I wish I had a better relationship with myself. So we can't sell that. We can't sell that. We've got to join in the conversation that they're that they're having. So, yeah, tell me, tell me, bring me any problem, and ultimately there'll be a relationship involved that can shift and that will help either dissolve the problem or solve the problem. Yeah, really nice. And so, yeah, Phil, I guess like like this yeah i think i think i said i can't remember if this was after we switched on the recording for everybody else or before that i was like i'm pretty sure i've got about 15 things that we could spend an hour on together and and, mm. and um it's hot in england today and so you're probably hot in, in, in ipswich and i'm hot in london in the end we'll have to have a drink or, or go to the bathroom before we do that i guess one of the things which we haven't I mean, we have touched on this. And, and if, if you feel like we've already answered this, feel free to bat the question away or just like tick it off really quickly. But there's something that you're in a kind of privileged position of, which I, I know that I am to a, to a certain extent as well from having had these kinds of conversations with other coaches. And, and again, you know, with you dipping into the, you know, what's real for them about, about an actual life as a coach. Um, and you hinted as well already, because you, you know, like we did before or after the call, you sometimes get even more of an authentic picture about what's happening in people's, in people's lives or, or because you know, these people, you know, they don't have it totally together. What have you learned from those? I mean, there's like 80, 80 something episodes. 
yeah what are the, what have you learned what are the patterns that you don't think you'd have seen without that and and i know some of it will be stuff we've already touched on but is there anything that we haven't touched on already or anything you particularly want to point well out? i think it's a it's a great summary isn't it and uh again i don't know where the quote comes from is it comparison is a thief of joy mm -hmm. so but and yet it's a natural thing like um, in a way that is at the root of how we navigate life by comparing with how we think it should be and yeah at the same time nothing really is how it appears to be so um what's been really wonderful is having those conversations and not just the recorded ones just over and over again talk to you know i made a lot of friends going through all of that training and since you know clients have become friends and uh i sort of like one of my clients this morning and i said to her i think i really feel that she sees me in a way that perhaps nobody else does mm -hmm. such as the intimacy of a coaching relationship we've been working together for what, just over two years now so um gosh it's I, I feel privileged in that um people share things when they feel safe to do so and so intimacy looks to me like being at the core of any fruitful relationship be it personal or professional so how do we create that safety i guess we go first so that's what I've learned, that nobody really has it together, even if they think they do. Mm -hmm. They might believe they do, but really underneath that, there is a human being and there is, you know, fallible and um, and just being willing to to go first when it comes to being intimate. Yeah. Um, maybe two more questions. First one is... I might have already said that. that was I'm good. Question. I'm I'm, I'm good for time. Ignore my, you know, it's more for listeners. It's like, you know, this is like, uh, this is what it's like <laughs> to be, be in my world. It's like, wait, wait, I've got more. I've got more. It's important. No. Um, I think it, I'd just love to know. I, I want to, the two things, let me tell you them. So one is I'd just like to get a, a picture for you, Net, from you now, as much as you can. And I don't know how you can do this, of like that. I think every, anyone who's listened to this will be able to feel the work you do. And you've talked about it in beautiful ways. Who do those people tend to be these days? Is there any interesting or useful way of talking about that? If there isn't, that's okay. And then the other one is more practically, I guess, just before we go, if, you know, before we finish, if there's anything that we haven't said that you've learned from, what did you say? Like, um, you know, being paid to coach since 2005, all the people you've learned from the, all the interviews is there anything that we haven't said that it's it's important that you think it's important to share with with people who might be listening i think yes the final questionnaire is probably not impossible to answer like yeah. i'm sure there is you know what i mean it's like and this is this is i think uh my comment to the question rather than the answer would be yeah just stop waiting mm. and get on with it anyway like um, a message for other coaches is to get out of the classroom and into the client's world because that's where you learn the most. Yeah. Um, the kind of people are people who want to enjoy life more in some way or other. So with me working with me right now, for example, is a single mother who's an entrepreneur um a guy who's um on the board he's you know chief whatnot of a very large uh, food company in the uk um and then there's a guy who works in a bar very diverse and others you know but they're, they're all diverse a guy works in corporate it's just it's all kinds of people but generally it's really what do they want they want to um they want to enjoy. So I, I know because I, I can help people change their relationship with themselves. This is kind of my biggest challenge, actually, is um, well, how, how do I like people talk about niches and stuff? Like, how do I then start talking about those people? Well, talk to those people. I very imagine the kind of conversations they're having in their in their heads. Like, so um, I can talk about how I changed my relationship with drink or how I've changed my relationship with food. And there were people that relate to that. So if I start talking about that, I can talk, I wrote a post today. I know we're recording this um, well before you put it out, but like today I wrote a post really about um, 
just the adventure of doing something different with my life and moving to Bali. And there'll be people that um, have that going on. Mm. So, I, and I could niche right down. It's like, oh, I could um, focus on divorced women that want to create a sustainable business, uh, new business in their fifties. You know, I could like niche down to that and I'm sure I could help those people. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but I think overall, <laughs> I'm I'm working with people who want to experience more joyful and easy relationships, mm-hmm. and that is pretty much what I'm talking about. And and the and very much centered to that is having a much more joyful, easy relationship with myself. I never used to like myself very much. I know I've already said this, right? But that that actually changes everything. Once you stop resisting who you are. Um, life just gets so much easier anyway so much easier anyway i hope that answers the question yeah and then i'm gonna kind of break my word um mm. for, is there something that made a real difference to you to help you like yourself better <laughs> mm. i wish i could say oh it was this one thing <laughs> yeah wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be great it'd be wonderful yeah somebody if somebody, if this reminds me by the way I, I several years ago i looked up the word i just typed fear into the search box on amazon and it said thirty-eight thousand results oh, that's a lot of books about fear and i did it again relatively recently and it says in excess of fifty thousand results so it could be 100 i don't know it just says that like there's a lot of books offering answers and i don't have there's there's no single answer to life but i tell you what shifted in me is to not be searching is to not really not i'm sure there's searching going on that i don't i'm not really aware of but it's it's not it's my life's no longer actually about um trying to avoid having regrets that would be probably my biggest regret of living a lot of my life trying to avoid having regrets it's no longer about searching it's like come on let's just get on with it i mean that's in a way like i moved to bali i've never even been to indonesia before and yet i'm like "Ah, okay let's just do it let's just kind of dive in and live much more like that and i'd encourage like again touched on if you want to run retreats if you want to coach people on the side of a mountain if you want to only coach billionaires you know there'll be a way that you can do that if you're willing to jump and go for it nice phil it's a wonderful way to to end the conversation thanks so much for um for being yeah being the change right for being the thing that that in that moment you saw wasn't happening in coaching like uh, it feels like that in this conversation that that has been really true so um thank you for doing that and for making a great podcast um thank you and for yeah all the time and energy this afternoon thoroughly enjoyed the conversation so yeah i'll be listening to some of your other um more formidable guests i'm sure thank you (laughs) yeah it's funny like i think just a really quick one on that i think that 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 came in my mind before i heard tim ferris say once the reason he does long interviews is to kind of try and get past the bit where people say the stuff they've always said and always say right, and right, i'm not okay. sure i quite managed what i had a similar intention to you when i spoke to jamie i'm not sure i quite managed it but it but it'd be interesting to see if you get through that one <laughs> if you think i got anything new because i think that's a it's yeah. a really good yeah thing cool to, um, to mention. but phil there's loads of stuff that I, we didn't even get to talk about people can check out your books and all that kind of thing too and we'll put we'll, we'll put links for listeners to um stuff we've mentioned in the show notes wherever they're listening and all that kind of thing and at the coachesjourney.com but mainly phil just super grateful to have had this chance to speak to you this afternoon thanks very much me too thank you